Well, good evening. This is Miss Dagan Ford, and I hope you're enjoying your four-day weekend. Uh, we're going to be um, starting our metabolism unit with uh, looking back at reactions. And you did some of this in um, chemistry class. And so as we uh, begin, I just want to give you a quick idea of your objectives. You should uh, have the ability to describe and identify the different types of reactions. You should be able to explain how an enzyme works and how and how the enzyme affects the reaction and the energy in the reaction. And you should then be able to explain what things can affect an enzyme. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Now I broke it down into major points. Um, reactions can be classified as the energy found in the reactants and the products. And you remember from chemistry class if you have something like carbon dioxide and water plus the energy in light will yield glucose and oxygen. And we know that the, these would be our reactants, these would be our products. Now, this is the equation. I know it's not balanced. Don't, don't, let's not worry about that right now. But this is the equation for photosynthesis. Plants are going to take the carbon dioxide in the air, um, water, and in the presence of light with the energy provided by the light, you're going to add that energy to produce glucose. Now, the ops, well, not the opposite exactly, but um, if you take glucose, in the presence of oxygen and break that down into carbon dioxide and water, you're going to capture the energy released and build energy molecules such as ATP. So we see in cell respiration, which is the second one, cell respiration, you're releasing energy and then using that energy to, and, and capturing it into another molecule. Whereas in photosynthesis, you're using the energy to build and you're putting the energy into the reaction. So this is a similar uh, idea between exothermic and endothermic exergonic and endergonic. So exergonic reactions release energy. So the y-axis here is going to be the energy. The x-axis is going to be the reaction. So we have the reactants and the products. And in an exergonic reaction, you start with a high energy in the reactants a low energy in the products and you'll notice that because there's less energy that means that energy is given off. Now we learned in the previous video that this means that there's a negative delta G, it's the negative, um, it's spontaneous. Now, this is going to be important to remember. Notice this little hump here. That's the amount of energy that the reactants require to get over the uh, energy that's kind of keeping them together. We're giving it enough energy to break or come together. Now, so that's exergonic. And then endergonic would be when we start with a lower amount of energy in the reactants. And then we're, again, we're going to see that little hump here. And then where the products are going to be higher energy. That means we're 
adding energy into the reaction, this is going to be a positive delta G. This is not spontaneous. We need to um, put energy into this. Now, so what is this little hump that I keep drawing here, this little bridge there? And this is called the activation energy. The reactants, the reactions must react with a certain amount of energy. And that's the activ activation energy. Now, you need to kind of go back to this idea that if you have the reactants, and this is just going to be an abstract idea, what you need to remember, there are bonds holding these molecules together. And in order to, to separate these atoms, the red atoms from each other and the blue atoms uh, from each other, that bond needs to be broken. Now, that's a pretty stable bond right there. So in order to kind of create that, you need to you kinda make that unstable. You need to add some instability, and that's going to be energy. And a lot of books sometimes um, uh, represent it as like these bonds are kind of shaky. And as they're shaky, that means they're unstable and they can then be broken. But these molecules can only do this if they have enough energy. Now, usually that's thought of as the force with which they collide. Um, and so with the red molecules and the blue molecules, if they're going to break those bonds, that means that they had to have enough energy um, to cause that instability, and then you might get that new molecule as a result of that. The bond, the old bonds were broken, and new bond, bonds were made. Now, that you need to have a certain amount of energy, activation energy. So that could be from... <coughs> Sorry about that. That could be from the movement of the molecules, um, how fast are they moving, and, and the, the speed with which they're moving is a reflection of their energy level. So if these guys are just going to slowly coming towards each other, nothing's going to happen, and that's represented in this bottom picture. And uh, so... The other thing that we need to look at is that not only is it the energy, but it's the orientation. And so um, if they don't come together correctly, then they're not going to react. Now, I sometimes like to imagine the molecules as kind of being Legos. And Legos are kind of a nice image because when you connect Legos together, they need to come together in a very specific way to create that connection between two Legos. If they, uh, so this way, they actually would connect together. But if you put two Legos side by side, because there are no connectors, if you brought them together that way, then they won't connect. So this is not going to connect your Legos together. This will, that one won't. So um, there are some nice diagrams out there that uh, help with this. So, for instance, this is an ineffective. Um, so these two molecules, the bonds that are holding them together are just not enough. I, I'm sorry, the energy that and the orientation that they're coming together are not enough to break those bonds. Um, and it's not enough to influence that transition from one molecule to the next. So they're not colliding in the right direction. So these bonds, you know, the electrons are not in the right spot. It's not creating that likelihood of the bonds breaking. Now, an effective collision, they are coming together in just the right way that the bonds are going to be affected. And what they uh, often use is this term transition state, where the transition state is this idea that there's a shift in the position of the electrons and how the electrons are being shared. Uh, and so uh, not only do you need the right amount of energy, but the, you need to have the right collision uh, for it to happen. 
So in this second one, they have the correct orientation and sufficient energy. And then they, you notice, um, you know, you have the black and the red in the one molecule and the red and the blue. Well, this time now you have um, the black with two reds. And that's where we've changed the, the type of molecule. So here's another diagram that shows it really nicely. In this case, they're moving too slowly. They're just sluggishly coming together and they just kind of bounce off. They, they, they don't react um, if they're not facing the right way. Um, and again, you know, you got to remember this atom has specific electrons around it. This one might have different electrons uh, in, the, in the different orientation. So if, if the electrons are not in that nice sweet spot, it's just, again, they're not, they're just going to bounce and go their own way. But if they have enough energy and if they're in the right orientation, then you're going to get the chemical reaction. So uh, now the, the last thing before we talk about enzymes is that react, react, I'm sorry, reactions can be catabolic or anabolic. Now I like to think uh, catabolic, you can think of catastrophe. And in a catabolic reaction, you're going to take a large molecule, and usually it's a large polymer uh, where you are taking this, but not necessarily, but that's a nice way to think about it. You are taking this large molecule, and in a catabolic, you are breaking it down into smaller molecules. And so you can think like in a building that like comes apart, that's a catastrophe, and that's a nice way to remember it. In an anabolic reaction, you're going to take uh, smaller molecules and you are going to build them and connect them to other small molecules to make a large. So um, they work in direct uh, opposition. In an anabolic, you are taking smaller molecules, building them, get, building them together to make a large. In a catabolic, you're taking a large molecule and breaking it apart into small. So how do um, enzymes work? Well, that's going to be the subject of our next video. Uh, but just remember, to conclude, you have to have the reactions, um, the reactants with the right amount of energy and the right orientation. And so think about that enzymes are going to affect those two things to speed up reactions. Thank you.